Okay, so as we saw in the previous section, an instrument is something that lets us split our policy variable or our program variable into its exogenous part and its endogenous part so that we can get rid of the endogeneity and we're left with just kind of the as if it is random exogeneity. Um, and then we can talk about causal effects. But what, what is an instrument? What the heck are these things? So in general, an instrument is just something that you can measure in the world. Um, but it has to meet specific um, criteria to count as an instrument and to work as an instrument. So there are three parts of the definition here. Um, the first is that it has to be something that is correlated with the policy variable. So in the case of education, it has to be something that causes education, which there are lots of things that cause education. Um, required schooling laws, um, how close you live to a school, um, ability to get to school with a school bus or a car. There's a whole bunch of things that kind of cause education. Um, and another term for this is relevance. And we'll look at more mathy explanations of these in a minute here. So an instrument is something that causes the policy. It is something that does not directly cause the outcome. It only causes the outcome through the policy. So what that means is if we pretend that required schooling for instance, like laws that say you must go to school. Let's pretend that's an instrument. That causes education. And then we have to say that does not cause additional earnings. Um, there's no plausible connection between mandatory schooling laws and wages. Maybe there is, maybe there isn't, but that's we have to be able to, to prove that there's no connection between the two. And then finally, an instrument is something that is not correlated with any of the omitted variables. So ability can't be connected to the instrument. Um, otherwise, it'll be just be confounding, just like any other confounding factor. So it has to be something completely exogenous to um, the whole relationship between education and earnings. So required schooling laws might work, um, where having required schooling in a state um, there might be other things that influence how much you get, um, how much education you get, and how much your wages are. I would guess that this actually messes up required schooling because you might have a state legislature that cares about education, which means um, that's going to influence how much education you get through mandatory schooling laws, but it'll also probably influence the jobs you get um, in your wages because most people will be educated, and so there's a connection there. Um, and that breaks the whole idea of using required schooling laws as an instrument because it's no longer or exogenous. Um, what this looks like kind of more graphically to help wrap your heads around this stuff, because this is weird stuff, um, is this right here. So if we look at this DAG, um, you have some program or policy or education, um, whatever program you are thinking about for your final project. So the program causes some sort of outcome. You have unmeasured confounders that you can't just adjust for in a DAG with inverse probability weighting or matching or whatever. You can't do anything with these. So an instrument is something that causes the program but does not cause the outcome. It only causes the outcome through the policy here. And there's no connection between the unmeasured confounders here and the instrument. It's just something that is totally kind of often left field that only causes the program. And you can use this to split this program node into two parts, the exogenous part and the endogenous part. So a more practical example that um, economists have used, they don't use this anymore because um, it's technically not a very good instrument. But like 20 years ago, they thought it was a great instrument. Um, it's this idea of father's education, where you can't, so we have education causing earnings. Um, this is our main outcome here. Ability is unmeasurable. Um, we don't have a magical ability column that we can control for. So right now, education is endogenous. Um, this is messing up the, the causal effect between education and earnings here. But father's education, um, 20 years ago, economists argued, was a good instrument because it causes you to get more education, but it does not cause you to get more earnings. It only causes you to get more earnings because of your education. That's the only pathway that we have between father's education and earnings. And it's also not connected um, with this unmeasured ability stuff. That does not cause father's education. There's no link between the two. 
And so according to economists 20 years ago, this was a great instrument because it's totally separate from kind of the rest of this DAG here. It only causes earnings through your education. Um, and then that is what lets you find the causal effect of education on earnings by using this instrument. Um, in more general terms, typically you see the DAGs written like this, um, where you have your policy node is X um, or your program. Um, y is the outcome here. U are these unmeasured confounders. You can be any number of them. And then you have Z, which is the instrument. So Z causes X. Z only causes, or Z is only connected to Y through X, and there's no connection between U and Z. Um, so if we look at this more formally, these are the three um, kind of definitions of an instrument. We have relevance, excludability, and exogeneity again. So this is kind of the more mathy definition for these things. So with relevance, it means that the instrument is correlated with the policy. There is a connection between Z and X here. So Z leads to X, and the correlation between Z and X should not be zero. There should be strong connection between Z and X. Um, excludability means that there's an arrow from Z to X to Y. So Z causes X, which causes Y. But it also means that there is no arrow between Z and Y. This little symbol here is an arrow with a line through it. It's kind of goofy in this font, but that's that's what it's showing. It's just an arrow with a slash through it. So Z is not connected to Y. So Z is connected to Y only through X. There's no other direct arrow to Z or any other direct indirect arrows. The only way Z can get to Y is through X here. And so that's what this part here means. Correlation between Z and Y so this node and that node should be zero if you control for x. If you look at the same level and level of x here, there should be no connection between z and y. Um, and so that's called the exclusion restriction or the excludability um, criteria. And then finally, exogeneity means that z is not connected to u. There's no arrow between all of these unmeasured things and the instrument. So there should be no arrow from u to z. Um, and there should be no correlation between U and Z either. So this is kind of the, the formal definition of these three criteria here, relevance, excludability, and exogeneity. Um, the way you test these things can be a little bit tricky. So relevance, um, this idea that Z and X are connected, that is testable with statistics. You can run a model um, that says X is explained by Z, um, and see how big of an effect there is and see how big of an F statistic that model has, which measures kind of the explanatory power of that model. So you can do this purely with stats and that's something you should always do. We'll go through the process of doing this. Excludability, this is tricky. Um, this is the idea that Z, the instrument, causes the outcome, but only because of the policy. It only goes through that policy. You can kind of test that with statistics. You can kind of draw a plot. You can run a model to see if Z and Y are connected. Um, but the only through idea that Z only goes through X, that is also mostly just a story that you have to tell. Um, it has to be a convincing story and it has to be a story that nobody else can falsify. No, if somebody can say, the instrument causes the outcome through these other pathways, then that destroys your whole excludability principle and ruins your instrument and you can't use it anymore. Um, and then exogeneity here, the connection between all these unmeasured things and the instrument, that you can't do statistically. And the reason why is because you can't measure you. You don't have any of these columns in your data set, so you can't see if there's correlation between these unmeasured things and Z um, because if you haven't measured these things. So you can't use stats at all to prove the exogeneity part of the instrument. You just have to tell a good convincing story that the instrument is totally unrelated to all of these other confounding factors, um, which makes it hard to use instruments um, because it can fall apart at any one of these stages here. as re like It can fall apart through relevance, through excludability, and through exogeneity. So let's look at some more practical examples of, of possible instruments that could explain the relationship between education and earnings. So first we'll look at relevance. 
So this is the idea that the instrument causes a change in policy or um, whatever our proposed weird outside thing causes more education. We want there to be some sort of relationship there. So one common instrument that people use in some applications is a social security number um, because those are generally unrelated to anything. Um, in this case, your social security number probably does not cause education um, unless there was some lottery system for specific types of schools and they used a social security number for that and anybody with like a social security number that ended in one, three, or five got to be in this private school. Maybe that could be used in it as an instrument because then you can say social security causes, your social security number causes education. Um, but in this case, it's probably not good. Um, third grade test scores. That's probably a relevant instrument. If you say your third grade test scores cause you to get more education, and that's probably true. Um, because doing well in earlier stages of your schooling generally leads you to get more schooling. Um, so sure, that could probably be relevant. Um, father's education, this, this instrument that economists used to love and we're going to use as the example today. Um, that's probably relevant. Having an educated father or an educated mother probably causes you to get more education. Um, and so that's relevant. Um, these last two here probably work as instruments based on relevance um, because these instruments, third grade test scores or father's education, cause you to get more education. It's this Z leading to X idea. There needs to be a strong relationship there. The next criteria we need, criterion we need to look at is excludability. And this is the trickiest one. Um, this is the idea that the instrument causes the outcome only through the policy. Or Z leads to X leads to Y, but there's no arrow between Z and Y. So if we look at this, Social Security number. This is maybe, um, maybe exclusive if we, say, if we say that Social Security number causes you to get more education because there is a lottery based on if, you're, if your Social Security number ends in one, three, or five, let's pretend that's the case then your social security number in that case would not cause you to get more money. It only causes you to get more money if you get more school. And it only causes that if you end in one, three, or five. So in that type of situation, there's no connection between your social security number and your wages at all, except through this mythical lottery that we're talking about here. And then that would, be, that would count as excludability right there. Um, because the social security number would lead to more education in a fake lottery system, which then leads to wages. But there's no obvious connection between social security number and wages on its own. Um, third grade test scores. Here, the story we'd have to tell is that third grade test scores make you get more education. So Z leads to X. And then your third grade test, and then you get more education, or, and then that leads to more wages. And so Z leads to X, X leads to Y. But the story we need to tell is that there's no possible connection between your third grade test scores and your wages. Um, so maybe your early grades don't cause wages except through education. Like that's the only pathway it can happen. We want there to be some relationship there that early grades cause greater wages later. But the only possible way that we can think about that is through education. Um, if we can find some other story that your third grade test scores leads you to some other node, which then leads to higher wages, then we can't use third grade test scores as an instrument. Finally, we have father's education here. Um, this is the idea that your father has some level of education and that causes you to get education, which then causes you to get more earnings. And if we want to talk about this exclusion idea, we have to say that your father's education does not influence your wages except through education itself. That's the only pathway. Um, which 20 years ago they said, yeah, that works, I guess. Um, but if you look at the slide here, it's the LOL. Um, because there are a host of other stories you can tell um, that lead of things that lead you to get more wages because of more education from your parents that has nothing to do with education. Um, so 
we can think of other nodes where, for instance, your father has more education and that causes you to be involved in more extracurricular activities. Um, and then that leads you to more wages. And there, we just broke the exclusion principle right there. Um, so we'll pretend it's exclusive for the sake of the session today, but it's really not. Um, finally, exogeneity. This is the idea that um, all of the unmeasured confounders have to have no relationship to the instrument. Um, social security number, that's a good exogenous instrument, if we can make a case that um, it is also relevant. Um, so this is the idea that there might be some confounding factors like ability, but ability is not related at all to social security number. So that's good and exogenous. Third grade test scores, that's going to be connected to ability as well. Um, which breaks the idea of using third grade test scores as an instrument because we're trying to find something that's totally outside of that ability node that is messing up education and wages. Um, but that ability node is also going to influence how well you do back in third grade. And so it's no longer exogenous, doesn't work. Father's education here, um, that kind of works. Um, if you can tell a story of kind of your ability, does not cause your father to get more education um, because like the timing of that doesn't work. Um, father existed before you. Um, so that kind of works. But again, it could be that um, there are other unmeasured confounders like your location, um, the zip code you live in, the level of poverty in the neighborhood you live in influences how much education your parents get, which also influences the amount of education you get, which also influences your wages, and so it can still break. Um, so again, it, it's all it all depends on the story here, um, which is hard. Proving this exogeneity thing and proving the exclusion principle is really, really hard because there are tons of ways that a an easy instrument like father's education um, is connected to everything else that you actually care about. Um, which is why, as you read in the causal inference mixtape, there was this interesting chapter or this inter interesting sentence um, from Scott Cunningham here, who says that basically, if you want to have a good instrument, it has to be weird. Um, people need to be confused when you tell them how the instrument is related to the outcome. And if they're not confused, and if it looks obvious, then that means it's probably not a good instrument. So saying that father's education causes you to get more education, which then causes wages, that seems really obvious. If you can find something weird um, that is totally unrelated to wages or unobserved things, um, like a social security number based lottery, that is weird. Um, and it's not going to cause wages. It's not going to be related to any of the unmeasured confounders. And so that works better as an instrument, but it has to be weird and non-intuitive. Um, so here's some examples of published um, instrumental variables papers where people have tried to take care of this unmeasured stuff like ability. Um, and they've been trying to measure the effect of education on income, for instance. And so People used to love this father's education idea, but as we've seen, that doesn't really work. Um, another common instrument is this idea of distance to college, um, which can be an instrument to, re to explain this ability that you can't measure um, so that you can measure the effect of education on income here. And the rationale there is that the closer you live to a university, um, the more likely it is that you will go to it. And so the arrow is saying distance to college causes more education, which then causes more earnings. Um, and if you want to tell the excludability story, you have to say that distance to college only causes better wages because you go to school more. But that can also break because generally college towns have more small entrepreneur startup type things because of a business school. Um, there's a whole like community of um, kind of high wage earners in kind of the neighborhood around a school, um, around a university, which means naturally those places are going to have higher wages and better opportunities. So even if you don't go to college and you live in kind of a college town, you're probably going to be better off than somebody who lives in a place that doesn't have a college, which then breaks that whole idea that distance to college only causes your wages to increase through education. So also doesn't work well. Um, 
there have been papers that look at the military draft um, and use that to kind of remove the exogenous, or remove the endogenous part of ability so that you're only left with kind of the exogenous part of education on income. Um, this works because the social security numbers um, were used for the draft. And so we talked about kind of this mythical education lottery where if, you're, if your number ended in one, three, or five, then you got to go to this special school. Um, that's how the draft worked If you're if, for the Vietnam War. Um, if your social security number ended in a specific number, you got drafted. And if it didn't, then you didn't. And so if you were drafted, you lost out on educational opportunities. And so what these researchers were able to say was that being drafted led to um, changes in education, which then led to changes in wages. And the only way that w the only relationship between draft status and wages was through education, um, which sounds OK. But again, it kind of breaks the exclusion principle because there are probably other reasons um, why being drafted in the military would influence your wages beyond like education, such as like PTSD, um, such as learning new skills in the military that you can then apply to the job market, um, such as richer families were able to dodge the draft. And so that messed up the relationship too. Um, so again, they, they kind of work as instruments. They were popular at one point, but they're not anymore. Um, some other examples here, if um, researchers have been interested in um, kind of does smoking cigarettes cause worse health outcomes? Um, one way of doing this is to um, like one way this is tricky. We talked about the front door criterion a few sessions ago um, where you had to look at the effect of smoking on tar buildup and then tar causing cancer. Um, but what some economists have been able to do is they say there's a whole bunch of other negative health behaviors that cause health and cause you to smoke. So we can get rid of that part by using an instrument, which is tobacco taxes. So if tobacco taxes are increased, that causes smoking or smoking patterns to decrease um, because when prices go up, quantity goes down. That's supply and demand there. And so the rationale is that tobacco taxes cause health, which is kind of a weird relationship, but it only causes health because of smoking cigarettes, where if you increase tobacco taxes, that decreases smoking, which then helps health. And so their argument is that tobacco taxes, there's no path between tobacco taxes and health other than smoking. And that seems more relevant, um, especially because this is kind of a, a far out there idea um, if you're just looking at the effect of smoking on health, and then you throw in taxes, that's kind of a, huh, instrument? That's kind of weird. Um, so that works. People who are, who are better at like public health economics would probably tell you stories and stories about how tobacco taxes don't work and violate all sorts of exclusion restrictions. So I'm assuming it's not the perfect instrument, but it's been used. Um, there are other things that people use in political science. Um, trying to look at the effect of increasing patrol hours for police on the crime rate. Um, you can't observe the number of criminals that exist in a city. Um, and so that's going to mess up your relationship. And so what researchers do is they look at election cycles um, because that increases the amount of, uh, of patrol hours and it, it, it's related to patrol hours there. Kind of like we saw in the Diff and Diff paper about um, the increased police presence after the uh, terrorist attack in Argentina. Um, that's kind of another example of an instrument. They didn't use it as an instrument. Um, they just used it as kind of a natural experiment with diff and diff. But that's the same concept. It's something weird that causes increased patrol hours, which then causes the crime rate to change. Um, you can do other things, um, looking at the number of overcrowding lawsuits um, in for prisons to look at the effect of the incarceration rate on crime. That works. Um, the nice thing about this is one thing that instrumental variables let you do is they let you deal with simultaneous causality, um, which many of you have been running into when drawing your DAGs, where you say education, for instance, education causes more earnings, which causes you to get more education, which causes you to get more earnings. And so which one do you look at? You have like a chicken and egg problem. Um, and so if you use an instrument, 
then that guarantees that you're looking at one direction of that causal relationship because the instrument only causes one of those nodes. And so that lets you limit the whole simultaneous causality to just one side of it. Um, one of my favorite examples here is this idea that uh, researchers were interested in this idea of Americanization leading to labor market success. Do immigrants who assimilate into their host country culture um, learn the language, um, kind of borrow all of the norms of, of the region, do they earn more money or are they more successful in the labor market? Um, and so that's the main policy question they have is if you are more Americanized, does that make you do better in the labor market? Um, ability is one of those big unmeasured confounders. There's a whole bunch of other things that confound that relationship there. And so what these researchers did is they used the Scrabble score of the person's name as an instrument to remove the endogeneity um, and remove all of this unmeasured ability stuff. The reason this worked is because Scrabble scores, the, the numbers on the tiles in Scrabble, come from a whole corpus of text um, of newspapers from the 1920s and 1930s when Scrabble was first invented. And so what the game inventors did 100, 100 years ago is they looked at the frequency of letters in a whole bunch of newspapers that were written in like normal New England English. And so they saw words, they saw like letters like E and S and A and T and R are super common and so they have low numbers. Um, while letters like G and Z and Y and J are less common, which is why they have higher scores. Um, so what this was kind of a sign of is that if your name was like John, um, you have a fairly low Scrabble score um, because it's not a super weird name. Um, and J, O, H, N are fairly common letters in 1930s English. Um, if you were an Italian immigrant, though, and you came to America and you kept your name as Giovanni, you're going to have a higher score because you have stranger letters. You have a V in there. You have a G in there. Um, and it's a whole bunch of other, let's G-I-O-V-A-N-N-I -N -N instead of J-O-H-N. And so your Scrabble score for your name is going to be much higher. They didn't play Scrabble necessarily, but this is kind of their way of measuring kind of the weirdness or the foreignness of a name. So if somebody has a name with a whole bunch of Z's in it, like if you're from Eastern Europe or from Poland, um, Z is a common name in, or a common letter in last names. Um, that's a really high scoring Scrabble tile um, because it's not very common in 1930s America. So. What researchers did is they found this huge database of immigrants um, from the 1930s and they were able to see if any of them changed their names upon immigration or if, or if they kept their names and they calculated a Scrabble score for each of their names. And so the story here is that the Scrabble score causes labor market success and the only plausible pathway for that to happen is through this idea of Americanization. People with immigrants with lower Scrabble score names would what they find is they have higher rates of success in the labor market. If your name is John, you're going to have better success as a grocer than Giovanni. If your name is William, you're going to have better success than if your name was like William from France. Um, if your name is Juan, you're going to have less labor mar market success than a John um, because of Scrabble scores. And so that is what they were able to find. They can control, they can get rid of all of this unobserved stuff by just looking at the instrument here. And they use the instrument to split this Americanization node here. It, they get rid of the endogenous part of it and they're left with just the exogenous part of Americanization. And then they can find the effect of Americanization on labor market success. This is a good instrument because it is weird. This is totally non-intuitive. Notice how it took me a lot longer to explain this than like father's education. If it takes you a long time to explain how the instrument works, um, that's probably a good sign that it's weird enough to act as an instrument. Um, if you can find another pathway for the weirdness of somebody's name causing labor market success other than assimilation into the predominant culture, 
good luck. Um, that's going to be a hard thing to do. Um, so this is this is a good instrument here, the Scrabble score. Um, finally, one super common instrument that you'll see out in the world is weather, because that is fully exogenous. That we have no control over the weather. If there's an earthquake or a rainstorm, um, it's not like anybody caused that. And so often you will see people look at the effect of economic growth on conflicts or on civil war specifically. Um, civil war people love to look at rainfall um, because what they say is that rainfall causes economic growth, which then causes civil war. And then that lets you get rid of all of these unmeasured things and simultaneous causality and the other things that, that distort the economic growth and conflicts relationship you say that rainfall causes economic growth, which then causes conflicts. And if you think about the exclusion principle, what you have to say is that rainfall only causes civil war through economic growth, or causes changes in civil war through economic growth. As we'll see in a minute, that's actually not the case. It sounds cool and weird, but it's not weird enough. Um, and there are other pathways you can get between rainfall and civil war that don't go through economic growth. So instruments in the real world are very, very hard to find. And it's mostly because of this exclusion restriction or the idea that the instrument causes the outcome only through the one policy node. And most proposed instruments fail this. So in that list of instruments we just looked at at that table, the only one that was like a good solid instrument was the Scrabble score idea. And there are probably people out there that have found ways of breaking the Scrabble score instrument. Um, so rainfall, for instance. People love to use this idea of weather as an instrument for a whole host of things. Um, because the, the thinking here is that weather, uh, if it rains a lot or it doesn't rain a lot, that causes changes in economic growth. So if it doesn't rain a lot, that will cause a drought, which then will cause civil war or change the propensity for going to civil war. So that's the relationship the researchers talk about is that rainfall causes civil strife, causes protests, causes whatever, because it influences the economy. And that's the only pathway. Um, but this paper that came out in October 2020, um, this guy went and looked at 185 different papers that use rainfall as an instrument. And he found 137 possible other pathways between um, the instrument and the outcome. So if somebody's saying that rainfall only causes civil war through economic growth, um, what this paper finds is 137 other possible ways to get from rainfall to civil war um, that aren't economic growth. So if you look at the actual paper, if you press um, P on the slides here, if you're following along, there's a link to the paper. Um, I recommend going and checking it out. It's, it's readable. Um, all of the headings are puns. It's a really fun paper to look at. Um, but he basically goes through and says, like, weather does not work as an instrument for all of these billions of reasons. Um, and here are all the different pathways you can get between weather and other things and the outcomes that you care about. And so it doesn't really work as an instrument. Um, it's also really tempting to look at ongoing crises um, as an instrument. So a pandemic is a good exogenous external shock to social systems everywhere. And in the early days of the pandemic, in uh, spring uh, 2020, lots of economists um, started looking at, uh, look, uh, at using COVID-19 as an instrument um, because it's weird. It's external to all sorts of relationships. So for instance, um, let's say you're interested in the effect of school attendance on your grades or on earnings or some sort of outcome. Um, there's a whole host of unmeasured confounders there. You can't um, control for everything. You can't do all of the statistical adjustment. So what you can do instead is use some sort of instrument that only that, that separates school attendance into the exogenous part and the endogenous part. And then because of that instrument, you can then you can measure the effect of school attendance on earnings. Um, so in order for this to work, we have to talk about the exclusion principle that COVID-19 causes reductions in school attendance, which then causes grades to change or earnings to change later on. Um, so that seems reasonable. But the part of the part of the exclusion principle where this doesn't quite work is we have to say that COVID-19 causes changes changes in grades or changes in earnings 
only through school attendance. There's no other pathway you can get from COVID-19 to grades or to earnings, which is absolutely not the case. Um, so if we look at this DAG here, here are just like five other nodes that I thought of um, that you can say COVID-19 causes social isolation, which then causes changes in grades or earnings. COVID-19 causes death, which then causes changes in grades and earnings, causes anxiety, causes job losses, causes a whole bunch of other stuff. So there's no plausible way of saying that COVID-19 causes grades only through school attendance. That is absolutely impossible. So if in a year or so, you see um, reports from think tanks and economists saying we are using COVID-19 as an instrument, that should sound all sorts of alarm bells in your head um, because it's not going to meet the exclusion restriction. That's not going to work um, because you have to, the only way that's going to work is if COVID-19 causes grades only through school closures and not any other pathway, which again is laughable. So basically, anytime you see any instrument idea out in the world, you need to think of some other way that that instrument can cause the outcome beyond the policy itself. And if you can, then you just broke the exclusion restriction. And that stinks for you. Um, and this is often if you ever go to a presentation by economists who are presenting a new paper where they have some cool instrument, um, the audience will immediately go to this idea and just start saying, what about this? What about this? What about this? Trying to tear down the, um, the power of the instrument um, by trying to find other pathways. And if you can find another pathway, then oh no. Um, so for instance here, the whole question um, when you're looking at does this meet the exclusion principle is does the instrument cause the outcome through some other pathway. Ideally, it only happens because of the policy you care about or the program you care about. So if we look here, rainfall causes civil war. All of these papers say it's because of uh, economic growth. Um, but also rainfall causes moods to change, um, which then can cause outcomes, um, different outcomes for civil war. Rainfall causes changes in voting patterns. People vote more optimistically if it is sunny outside. People vote more pessimistically if it's rainy outside. So if it's raining a lot during an election, that's going to cause people to vote differently, which will then cause changes in civil war outcomes, which has nothing to do with economic growth. So it broke. Tobacco taxes cause something. Our, the main policy we care about is smoking rates. So tobacco taxes cause changes in smoking rates, which then cause health outcomes. Um, one way this could potentially break is that um, if you raise tobacco taxes, people will stop buying cigarettes, but they'll switch to some other unhealthy um, vice. Um, they'll buy more donuts. I don't know. Um, they'll do something, and then that will then change health. And so suddenly that pathway is no longer exclusive. Um, finally, the Scrabble score leading to Americanization, leading to labor market success. Um, that one, because it's a strange, bizarre instrument, that's trickier to, to find some other alternative path. Um, if you can think of the, the weirdness of your name causing something, which then causes labor market success, then that will violate the exclusion restriction. If you can't think of kind of that something, then you're probably safe with the exclusion restriction. So in general, that's what an instrument is. It has to be something that's relevant, meaning the instrument causes the, the program, it has to be something that is exclusive, um, which means the instrument causes the outcome only because of the policy, and it has to be exogenous, meaning none of these unmeasured confounders lead into the instrument. It is totally separate from any confounding that you have. If your proposed instru instrument meets all three of those criteria, then you have a cool instrumental variable, which you can then use to split this program node into the exogenous part and the endogenous part. And then you're left with just the causal effect of the program on the outcome, which is the magical part of instrumental variables. That's where we want to get to. But the only way to get there is to make sure it meets all of these assumptions. And that's the hardest part.